Welcome to Chemisode. This is the first video in Unit 2 for the Chemisode series. As you can see at the top there, we have a new Edmodo group code. Um, if you want to get the notes for these videos, you can go to the Edmodo page, sign up and join our group for Unit 2 Chemistry. This video is about the properties of water, so we're going to look at um, some of those properties of water, explain why water has these properties, and give some applications for these properties as well. So how can we can use these in um, nature, basically. So let's go have a look at these properties of water. A few key knowledges, a few prior knowledges that you should know, things that you need to know for um, this, this podcast, things that I'll be referring to that have been taught in Unit 1. First of all, you need to understand about valence structures for com covalent compounds. So how to draw valence structures would be a nice um, prior knowledge to have. You need to understand about polarity, so how um, you can tell if something is polar or nonpolar. You should also have an understanding about the three different types of intermolecular bonds that um, can occur. You need to know, understand what hydrogen bonding means and how to um, identify something that has hydrogen bonding. You need to understand something about dipole-dipole bonding. You need to understand also about dispersion forces and where these occur. Remember, hydrogen bonding occurs between polar bonds to polar molecules, which have F, O, or N, so that means FON, fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, attached to a hydrogen atom. So that's where you have hydrogen bonding. Dipole-dipole bonding occurs in polar compounds, and you have dispersion forces with non-polar compounds. And another little reminder that hydrogen bonding is stronger than dipole bonding, is stronger than dispersion forces. So dispersion forces is the weakest or the weak, dipole-dipole is the second weakest or the weak, and hydrogen bonding is the strongest of the weak type of intermolecular bonding that we have. So you need to understand about these things here before we go into the next area. But let's go, um, let's consider that you understand all this stuff. Let's, under, let's consider that we have an idea about all this stuff from Unit 1. And let's go into the properties and uses of the fabulous compound that is water. So, this podcast you'll be able to explain and apply the following four properties and use for probably properties of water. You'll be able to explain why water is a liquid at room temperature and why this is a good thing. You'll be able to explain why um, water expands when it freezes. So when you go from liquid water to frozen ice, it expands. You'll be able to understand what and define what latent heat energy is and you'll be able to explain why latent heat energy. You'll also be able to talk about specific heat capacity and you'll be able to define that, explain why water has a high specific heat capacity and also apply this in um, the real world as well. So you'll be able to give real world examples for each of these as well. So let's go have a look at the first one, why liquid is a why water, sorry, is a liquid at room temperature. Here it is. Why is water a liquid at room temperature? This is due to the strong intermolecular forces holding the two water molecules together. Here we have two water molecules. We have obviously the red here is the oxygen and the blue grey thing here, looks more like a, um, a Tiffany green, Tiffany blue, is a um, positive hydrogen um, atom. What we've got is a attraction between the hydrogen here, which is the slightly positive, and the negative oxygen here. What this does is it holds the molecules of water pretty close together and pretty strongly together, and that way we have these molecules of water slightly attracted to each other, and this makes it stick together and become a liquid at room temperature. This means that water has a relatively, I say relatively, high boiling point and a relatively high melting point as well, in terms of compared with molecules of the same size. Okay, it has a high or relatively high melting point. Um, being a liquid at room temperature allows it to act as a good solvent and dissolve lots of different substances. Okay. Um, that's a very important thing in terms of why um, 
we use water and humans are made of water and water is a major part of earth is because it can dissolve lots of things and reactions can happen inside the water itself. So as I said, the property is it's a liquid at room temperature. The explanation is due to the intermolecular forces holding the two together. These are called hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonds are a relatively strong intermolecular force. Hydrogen bond occurs between the slightly positive hydrogens, these grey green things here, and the slightly negative oxygen, which is the red thing here. So that's why water is a liquid at room temperature, because of the relatively strong intermolecular forces. Let's move on. Our next example is why water expands when it freezes. Why does water expand when you freeze it? Um, as you know, well, um, most of us would know, if you put a bottle of drink in the, fr in the freezer and if you um, it's a full bottle of drink, you put it in the freezer, the next day you go back to it and the lid has come off or the side of the container has split. It's cracked. This is because water expands when you freeze it. It's very different to other molecules. You might have done when you were um, in year 7 or year 8, you might have played a game where you pretended to be a solid then pretended to be a liquid and pretended to be a gas. If you did that, you would have gone through the normal process of going from a solid to a liquid to a gas where you're constantly expanding going that way. Or if you're going from a gas to a liquid to a solid, you're constantly contracting and you'd obviously um, go closer in together um, as a solid. However, water is different. Water expands when it freezes. It, it gets bigger. The reason water expands when it freezes is due to hydrogen bonding again. What happens is the hydrogen bonding arrangement makes the water actually expand. It takes up more space. You can see here that um, when water is a when water freezes, okay, the positive hydrogens, which are these white little dudes here, line up with the lone pair of electrons on your um, oxygen here, and that has to happen in a certain way, and it wants to be as far away as possible. It wants to have the the lowest energy arrangement, and to do that it arranges itself in what's known as the ice crystal. Now, you can see it better here, and you have massive gaps in here, the massive gaps in between these water molecules. Okay, Because the arrangement of um, water has large holes in it, the ice crystal is less dense than liquid water. Okay, Being less dense makes ice float. This is a very important thing in terms of how it's used in our everyday life. The reason or the, the explanation or the application of this property is that ice being expanding or ice expanding when it freezes allows for aquatic life to survive because the ice floats and forms a protective layer, like an insulating layer on top of a lake or on top of a top of an ocean. If, for instance, the, that ice did shrink when it froze, what would happen is it would freeze, it would become more dense, and hit the, sink, hit the bottom of the lake. And thus you would end up with a completely frozen lake and um, fish which are stuck in that ice. As it stands, um, ice does not shrink, it actually expands when it freezes, and thus it floats, and therefore you get that insulating layer allowing fish and other aquatic organisms to survive underneath the ice. And you know that because you've probably seen documentaries where you see polar bears walking on ice and eating fish out of the ice as well. Moving on, that's the properties of expanding on freezing. Let's have a look at the next property. The next property is something that is called a high latent heat energy. What a high latent heat energy means is it has the ability or a high, a large amount of energy needed for it to change a state. Okay, the latent heat energy of a compound is the ability or the energy required to change state. That means going from a solid to a liquid or from a liquid to a gas. Okay, the reason water has this high latent heat energy, surprise, surprise, again, it's due to hydrogen bonding. 
Now, because water exhibits hydrogen bonding, it takes a lot more energy for it to change state. Remember before, where we had the prior knowledge, we are talking about hydrogen bonding. It's the strongest of the weak forces. Okay, Being the strongest of the weak forces, it takes a lot of energy for it to break these hydrogen bonds and change the state that it's in. The energy used to change state, i.e. that means the energy um, needed to go from a liquid to a gas, is known as the latent heat energy. So what the latent heat energy is, is the energy needed to break this bond here and for these molecules to come apart. And because this bond is a hydrogen bond, which is a relatively strong bond, it means you need a lot of energy for it to break, a lot more than things that are non-polar or don't have hydrogen bonds. Why is this interesting? Why do we care about this property? What is the application in the real world for this property? Well, here it is here in the little box. Humans have a cooling mechanism that relies on water's latent heat energy. So that means the way that we cool ourselves down uses water's high latent heat energy. Sweat is the natural cooling system for our body. So we sweat and that's how we cool down. If we run around a lot, we sweat more. That's our, our body trying to cool us down. When we are hot, we sweat. This water that we sweat out then absorbs heat from our body to evaporate. So the latent heat energy is the energy needed to evaporate our sweat. It gets this energy from our body. So our, the water that we sweat out absorbs heat from our body to evaporate. This is also the reason we feel much colder when we're wet or when we just get out of the ocean. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's your idea where we have our latent heat is um, the energy needed to change state. The application in the real world is where we're sweating. If we sweat, what happens? The water absorbs the heat from our body and that's using it to evaporate. Let's move on to our last example and that is water's high specific heat capacity. Now I'm just going to define this one. I'm not really going to explain why it happens because I don't really want to do that. It has something to do with hydrogen bonds, but I don't want to go into the details of that one anyway. The specific heat capacity in water, or specific heat capacity in general, is the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of substance by one degree centigrade. Okay, So it's the amount of energy required to increase the temperature of something. It's also the ability to... Um, of a substance to retain that heat or that energy as heat. So if you heat something up, it's going to stay hot for longer if it has a high specific heat capacity. Water, it has a relatively high specific heat capacity. That means it takes a lot of energy to heat water up. It requires a lot of energy. You need to put a lot of energy into water to heat it up to increase the temperature. But the good thing is that the water, water itself as a substance, it will stay hot for longer once it is in there. Water has a high specific heat capacity, and you should know it's around about 4.2 joules per gram per centigrade. So that means it takes 4.2 joules to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. How can this be applied in nature? How can this be applied in the world around us? Well, it's to do with a hot day and you're at the beach. Okay, think about a hot day, you're at the beach, you've got the sun blistering in, it's about 45 degrees, really hot day of summer. What you notice is the sand underneath your feet becomes really, really hot. Basically, if you step onto the sand, you'll really hurt your feet. This is because sand has a much lower heat capacity than water. Sand, is, I think, is about 0.28 from memory. Um, I should probably should have Googled that before I put it in here. And water is about 4.2. That means in a hot day, sand will heat up much quicker than water. So because it takes less energy to heat the sand up, the specific heat capacity of sand is lower, it will heat up much quicker than the water itself. So on a hot day, you're walking across the beach, the sand's really hot, you get to the water, it's not as hot because it takes more energy to heat water up than it does the sand. This is also the reason that water can store the energy for longer. Okay, and so that when the sun goes down um, at night, even though the sand goes back to a normal cool temperature, the water stays a bit warm. So on a cool night, sorry, on a 
on a night in summer, the ocean will feel quite warm compared with the sand because it has the ability to store that energy. We're going to look at um, a couple of calculations um, in terms of specific heat capacity because what you need to be able to do is use this equation that energy equals the specific heat capacity times the mass times the temperature change to calculate the energy and also to calculate the temperature change that you have. I'm not going to do some examples here. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to film myself actually doing some questions and looking at the setting out that I use for these um, types of questions in terms of spe specific heat capacity and that will be another video in itself. So just remember that you should be able to use this um, equation properly. You need to be able to calculate energy, calculate specific heat capacity if you need to, calculate temperature change using this um, equation. This needs to be committed to memory because it's not on your cheat sheet. It's not on the data booklet. Moving on. Um, you also should be able to understand or I'm just going to introduce you to a few common temperatures that we deal with. Common temperatures are SLC which means standard laboratory conditions. This is also known as room temperature. This is about 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, It's just the normal conditions that are in a lab. At a, at a cozy um, lab it's 25 degrees Celsius. Standard temperature and pressure. Um, this is 0 degrees Celsius. So STP is um, um, 0 degrees Celsius. And you should also know that the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius and the freezing point of water is 0 degrees. So just remember those type of things. The boiling point of water 100 degrees Celsius, STP 0 degrees Celsius, SLC is 25 degrees Celsius. These will help you in your calculations because some of your calculations will require knowing these abbreviations for standard laboratory conditions and standard temperature and pressure. Lastly we have a summary. Um, this is what you should be able to do after this. Um, you've watched this video and probably if you've watched the, um, the video explaining how to do some calculations. You should be able to use the four properties of water that we just discussed to explain observations in nature. You should be able to explain why those four properties of water exist. It's always to do with hydrogen bonds, remember that. And you should be able to explain observations in nature. They're the ones that were in the, um, the dark boxes. You should be able to use the specific heat capacity formula to calculate temperature change and energy. Okay, So you should be able to use that formula. As I said, um, a video will be out showing you how to do that. You should also be able to recall the common temperatures, SLC and STP. To help you with um, doing this, there's a few different things that you should do as well. You should look at the textbook and reference for the textbook here is 10.3. So chapter 10.3 goes through these properties of water. The questions that you should be able to do minimum in the textbook are questions 3, 4 and 5 from chapter 10. Remember the chapter, the sorry, the textbook that we're using is the Heinemann textbook. Um, it's the green Heinemann textbook for Unit um, 1 and 2 Chemistry. There's a new Edmodo code out, so for Unit 2. Um, the Unit 1 will still be there, but I won't be putting new things on there. The group code for Unit 2 Chemistry is 8 point, sorry, 83WCXK. So you join this group code on Edmodo. And also on Edmodo, there's a quiz called the Water Quiz. I'd like you to have a go at that and try and um, answer those questions. Um, to answer the water quiz, I think you'll actually need to read up on chapter 10.1 and 10.2 as well, where you're looking at the water cycle. It's quite an important thing as well. So um, they're the things you should be able to do. They're the things that you, um, to show your knowledge, you can do those. And I'll get on to writing and making the video for this specific heat capacity formula. And yeah, we'll look at solubility in our next um, main video on that as well. So take it easy, have a go at these things, join the new Edmodo group code um, and I'll chat to you when I do my next video. Take it easy.